Join us now on Flickr at flickr.com slash groups slash art of photography. Hey everybody, welcome back once again to the Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes and we've got a brand new studio set up today which I am excited to show you. And more importantly, we're going to be looking at large format photography today. Uh, in the last episode we talked about how your sensor size or your film size determines uh, what the focal length will do for your picture uh, with a lens. And today we're going to be kind of talking about the biggest of the biggest, uh, which is using large format film photography. You can also use large format digital photography too, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, we're going to go large. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a really big camera. Uh, this is a Cambo 8x10, and I actually use this for 4x5s, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but more or less, this camera is completely mechanical, so there are no electronic components on here at all. Um, why would you shoot on a camera like this? Well, be you basically, everything in photography comes with a trade-off, as you know, and you pretty much trade off any kind of convenience. This is very slowed down composition, this is uh, very meticulous work, uh, but you gain everything in terms of image quality. It's a very uh, high quality negative. I can go up to 8 by 10 on here so I can get really high definition images, uh, more so than what you would even get with a digital camera, I think. Um, Anyway, uh, there are two flavors, more or less, of large format cameras. There's what's known as a studio camera and what's known as a field camera, and this is a studio camera. Uh, the biggest difference between the two is the studio camera is big and heavy and bulky, and you would not want to go shoot a wedding or a sporting event with this, but you probably uh, you know, could use it for landscapes, still lives, things like that. Um, I'll swing it around. Basically, what you're dealing with here uh, is, is what they call standards. Okay, now first of all, let me flip this up because this is not actually part of the camera. This is a lens shade that has a second set of bellows on it, so don't confuse that as part of the setup. Um, but anyway, it's comprised of two standards, which is this front part and this rear part. And the standards, basically, the front standard holds up the lens board. The rear standard holds up the film plane. In between the two are a set of bellows. So uh, the bellows are flexible, obviously, so this is how you focus the camera simply by moving the standards in and out. And you can see the bellows flex along with it. So if I'm, you know, need infinity focus, I would go back that way. Uh, you could do extreme macros with this if you had a long enough rail set and a long enough bellows extension. You could extend this as far out as you need and, and shoot the smallest things in the world. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of, um, you know, uh, what you can shoot with this. Uh, anyway, that's the front standard. The front standard contains the lens board and this is a little unusual. Um, this lens that I have mounted in here right now, the lens and the shutter are all one piece, and this was actually taken off of an old Polaroid camera, uh, an old Pathfinder. The Pathfinders are obsolete. You can't get film in the correct size anymore on these, uh, but the lenses are just incredible. So you see a lot of people purchasing these old Pathfinders and then using these Rodenstock lenses on their large format cameras because it has enough coverage for 4x5 at least. Um, this is not a dark lens board. This is a piece of cardboard that I made, and I didn't have a lens board for this particular lens. So uh, that's probably under the category of kids don't try this at home, but I've never had any issues with it and it seems to work just fine. Uh, let's look at the rear standard. The rear standard, basically uh, what you're looking at here is this, this camera. Let me open this up so you can see. This whole part comes off and you can see inside. Really what this is is a big black box. This is a camera obscura. You've just attached a lens to one side and film to the other side. Uh, I have a series of backs for this. Um, this is a 4x5 back which you can see everything is reduced down to 4 inches by 5 inches. I also have an 8x10 back so if you have a lens that will cover it I can do an 8x10 negative in here which is really really cool. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to shoot 8x10 because it's such a pain, but uh, 4x5 works great. So I use this reducing back on here, which basically has a mounted 4x5 ground glass. Uh, inside the ground glass, you can see I have a 4x5 holder. So these holders will hold your sheet film, is what this film is known as. It's not a roll like 35 millimeter or 120. Uh, this is done in, in sheets. And so basically what you do is each holder will hold two sheets of film. So I can pull out what, this is called the dark slide. You pull this out, you open the back door here, and you basically slide a piece of sheet film down in there. You can do black and white, slide film, color film, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then when I put that back down, there's a little lock on the top, so I keep that from flying open while I'm outside. And this keeps the film completely dark. And you can put a sheet on each side. And so what you would do when you're going to take your picture is you use the ground glass here to compose and focus onto your subject. There's a little switch here so I can make this portrait orientation or landscape so you don't have to flip the whole camera, which is very nice. Um, and then once you're ready to shoot, once you're in focus and everything, typically you would use, you could use a sheet over your head uh, if you're outdoors and you need to get the light right uh, and be able to see the ground glass. I just use a jacket usually. Um, I don't have a, 
uh, a curtain for it. Uh, anyway, slide the film holder down in there once your subject is composed. And then what I do is I bring up the dark slide on the front. And you can take it out if you want. I just tend to bring it up so I don't uh, um, hack the film when I'm going back down into it. Uh, go ahead and take your, your exposure and put this down. You can take it out and flip it over and you can take a second shot. Okay, so that's basically how the camera works. It's very simple. There's front standard, a rear standard, a bellow set, you have your lens on the front and you have your film on the back. Uh, everything else is a matter of focusing. Now, the major advantage to a large format camera is this. Uh, large format cameras, especially studio cameras, um, they uh, support a technique um, called using movements and basically you have all these knobs on each standard and I basically can get a wide range of movements by twisting these knobs so for instance um, you know if I loosen these bottom two here I can get rise and fall is what this is known as. I can bring this whole standard up or bring it down now in relationship to the lens uh, that affects the image so it would actually rather than raising the camera you can kind of cheat up or down just by using the rear standard um, I will do a whole separate podcast on, sta on, on movements because it's pretty involved and I'd like to show some images and stuff. I'm just giving you an overview today of the of the 4x5 camera. But basically <coughs> each of these knobs controls the various movements. I can rise, I can fall, I can shift to the left or the right, and then what's really interesting is I can I can tilt. So I can, there's a hinge down here at the bottom. It's actually right down here. And if I um, if I adjust the knobs, I can actually make this whole thing tilt in or tilt back. Why would you want to do that? I'll explain in a second. I can also tilt it in the middle. So you can tilt it on the lower axis or right halfway through the film. You can tilt like that. Um, all of these standards, oh, and I can also tilt it to the right and the left on the middle axis. Um, all of these standards are available on, or all of these movements are available on both standards, which is pretty interesting. Um, now, what is that used for? Um, again, we'll do a separate podcast where I explain this in more detail. Uh, but there's basically two things, two techniques you can use motion for um, in how you have your standard set. Um, in the last podcast we talked about focal length and one of the issues with focal length that you can have is distortions that occur with either what's known as barrel distortion on wide angles or pincushion distortion on um, really long telephoto lenses. And what you can do is particularly this is used the most on wide angle lenses for shooting architecture. If you have too much barrel distortion you can actually alter the focal plane by moving either the front and or the rear standard and you can correct some of those distortions. So that's huge. If you're doing real accurate uh, landscape photography, you need to be able to do that or architectural work. Um, the other thing that it can be used for is more of a tilt shift selective focus kind of thing. And so what I can do is because you're managing um, the focal plane typically is the point where the film sits that's exactly in focus with the lens. What I can do is I can shift that focus. So you can actually throw that focus into like, and I use this a lot in my own photos and a lot of times it's simulated because I'm doing it on the iPhone. But it's the same effect that you get on the large format, which I use a lot as well, where you can actually put selective focus on an object. Object. It's kind of like using depth of field, but rather than using the lens to do that, you're using the focal plane to do that. So you can get some really interesting effects and some really dramatic blurs and shifts going on. Um, if you look at photographers like um, um, Keith Carter does this a lot. Um, there's some other guys too that really use it to a nice effect and get a nice dreamy blur look. Uh, but anyway, that's more or less how this large format camera works. Um, once again, it's just the, the size of the negative is, is benefit number one. Um, you can get digital backs for these. They tend to be what are known as scanner backs. So better light companies like that that make them. And you basically would attach this over where the film goes and it actually does a scan like a scanner does of the image because it's so large. Um, film sensors quite, haven't quite caught up in this day and age to that, that kind of uh, size yet. Um, but w I mean what I enjoy the most about shooting large format is that you get all of the clarity and um, resolution that you do with, with a really high-end digital camera but you still have the warmth of using film and you're still able to use a lot of the film processing techniques particularly with black and white which I do a lot of. Um, so anyway that is more or less the large format. This is a Cambo. Um, and the, another th cool thing I can tell you about these is back in their day when this was kind of uh, the standard studio camera to use uh, because it had the highest resolution, I'm talking about early digital and before digital, uh, these were not cheap. Um, you would pay several thousand dollars because of all the parts and all the precision that goes into something like this. And you know, as far as the build quality on here, they're worth it. Uh, but the cool thing is now is most photographers that work commercially have shifted over to digital. So a lot of people are getting rid of this and just like darkroom equipment 
equipment, you can find some really good used deals on on, uh, on cameras like this. You don't need to buy an 8x10. In fact, 8x10 is a little bit difficult to work with anymore, uh, but 4x5 certainly works. The camera's a lot smaller. You could do a field camera, something like that. The field cameras are really nice. They tend to be made out of wood, things like that, and they still hold their value a little bit, but the studio cameras you can get used for, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars will get you a camera, uh, another couple hundred for a lens, and then you get a tripod and you're on your way. Um, spend the rest of your leftover money on a nice light meter and uh, you've got a, a pretty cool little setup. Uh, so yeah, definitely the um uh, the uh, the cool factor or the in factor is worn off so you can get um, into a large format system pretty inexpensively. Uh, you can also shoot large format if you don't want to go with a camera this size. I've got some pinhole cameras and we can talk about that or you can even build a camera because basically your sheet of film is so large and you're not dealing with roll film. It's one shot per uh, sheet. Um, there's a lot you can do with that and so we'll get into that in future episodes and I also want to talk about motion and movements in the next one. So anyway that's pretty much what we're dealing with with large format photography and once again this has been the art of photography and thank you for watching.